If you can, turn with me in your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 4. We're going to be looking at a, familiar, a few familiar texts, but I want to lay a foundation. Hebrews chapter 4 reveals to us the types of things that God is looking at. The things that He discerns. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12. The Bible says, For the word of God is quick and powerful. It's what? Powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the hearts. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are what? Are we there? Yes. Are, are we sure we're there? Yes. Okay, Let, let's try this again. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are? Naked and open. Naked and open unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. I find it amazing that... The Word of God has the power to cut, and it is discerning our thoughts and intents. It is making naked and open to the eyes of God everything in the inward parts, the dark recesses in the heart of man. Why is this important? Turn with me to Jeremiah chapter 17. Jeremiah 17. Why is it important that God is looking at the inward part of man, the thoughts and intents of the heart, that all things are naked and open to his eyes? Because we have a problem. We're talking about our greatest enemy. Jeremiah 17 and verse 9, the scripture says, The heart is what? Deceitful above all things, and desperately wicked, who can know it? I, the Lord, search the heart. I try the reins, even to give every man according to his ways, and according to the fruit of his doing. So our hearts, the scripture says, is deceitful above all things. There's nothing more deceitful than your own hearts, which is amazing, because the thing about deception is that you don't know you are deceived. So we have a natural inclination towards hypocrisy. It's easy for us to see the problem in others, but it's ourselves that is our greatest enemy. We love to justify ourselves, to blind our actions. We are at many times not in sync with the true motives that prompts our actions. We're going to be looking today at what God is looking at. He's looking at the motives, the thoughts and intents of the heart. So we're going to be asking ourselves, what is our motive during this presentation? Turn with me to Ecclesiastes chapter 12. Ecclesiastes chapter 12, we're going to be seeing. This is the standard by which God judges the world in which we are going to be standing in the great day before our maker. Ecclesiastes chapter 12, and we're going to be beginning in verse 13. God is looking at our motives. So, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. Why should we fear God and keep His commandments? Verse 14. For God shall bring every work into judgment with every, what kind of thing? Secret. Secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. Christ is speaking to those who are professing to keep His commandments. Many times we might profess to have a regard for God's laws, and obedience to his principles, but 
God is not just looking at the actions. He is looking at the motives that prompts our actions. He's looking at the secret thing. Every secret thing is open and naked before God. And at the judgment, we are going to be met not only for the, the acts that we do, the decisions we make, but why we made them. Turn with me to Proverbs chapter 16. Proverbs chapter 16. I, I was reading this verse, and I was... I, I was, I was, I could really see how we, the heart of man is so deceitful. We are inclined to think so well of ourselves, to always give ourselves the benefit of the doubts. Proverbs 16, 2. But when it comes to others, we can be ruthless. We can be quick to discern the motive of my brother, but of our own hearts, we are, through neglect of self-examination, we, we're not in tune. So the appeal today is to be in tune with our hearts and to search ourselves. Proverbs 16, verse 2, the scripture says, All the ways of a man are clean in who's eyes? In God's eyes? In his own eyes. But the Lord weigheth the spirits. So the Everything that we do, we think it's very clean, it's very pure. But God is weighing the spirit. There's no thought, there's no motive of the heart that God is not acquainted with. He sees as clearly our motives are registered in the books of heaven as though they were written with living characters. He weighs individual motives and actions. And he is encouraging us to take a closer look. And I, I, I want to submit to you that really there are only two motives. There's two fundamental motives why we do anything. And how we do anything is how we do everything. So once we get down to the basic fundamentals of these two motives that they can be, it helps give us clarity to, or a guideline, a standard, a law by which we we can judge our own hearts. We can test ourselves. Turn with me to Galatians chapter 5 and verse 5. Galatians chapter 5. We recognize that we are saved by faith. We are saved by grace through faith. That it is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. There is this old time contention often. Are we saved by faith or are we saved by works? Which one is it? And we can see the answer in Galatians chapter 5. Verse 5, the scripture says, For we through the Spirit wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. For in Jesus Christ neither circumcision availeth anything nor uncircumcision, but faith which worketh by love. So are we saved by faith or are we saved by works? Faith that works. It's a faith that works by what? Love. Love. So you don't have good works to be saved. You have good works because you recognize God first loved you. And because you love God, you want to return to Him what He has given you. I want to share with you a quick story. When in my early um, teenage experience, I, I was really struggling to be kind to those around me. I was very rebellious. I didn't have very many friends, and my family had given up on me. I had gone through many, many mentors, grew up without a father, and so people tried to take me under their wing, and I was just such a rebellious and unruly child. People would want to step back, and they're like, I, I can't handle this kid. They'd see me, I've been called pure evil, devil child. People question if the grace of God was able to, to reach me. And, and sometimes I, I question if God's grace could reach me as well. Maybe you have been in a similar experience, or maybe you're currently in a similar experience. But I, I, I wasn't happy with how, where my life was going. I wasn't happy with the actions that I was making. 
because they were like bondage. The more that I did wrong, it just pushed the very people away that I wanted to come near to me. What I didn't want to do, I did. What I did want to do, I didn't. And it frustrated me. So I tried to change. And there's a few times in my life where I tried to do the right thing. And I wanted to do the right thing so that my sister could notice. So that my mom could see a difference. So that my, my aunts, my cousins, so that someone could see that I'm a changed person. But when I would make promises, when I'd make changes, make decisions, and, and purpose in my heart that I'm going to be contribute more to the family, that I'm going to be more kind and respectful, the moment I would slip up it is often repeated back, heaped upon me, see, you're the same Enoch, you haven't changed, nothing is different, and you're always going to be like this. And those words were so crushing, because others didn't see the change in me, it made me want to give up and, and just accept the label that was placed upon me, and was like, yeah, you're right, the same Enoch, the same, same person, never going to change. I should just go back to being me. And I didn't want to be that way. But it wasn't until I saw Christ and the love that he has given at Calvary and how he gave everything for me. And I was filled with this gratitude that I just wanted to express. I wanted to give back to God what he has given me. And once my motivation for reform changed, that my motivation was not to be seen or recognized by the people who are closest to me, but that I want to give back to God what he has given me, everything changed in an instant. It was like a 180 degree turn. And I purpose in my heart, even if my family doesn't see, I'm going to change because God wants me to change. Amen. And because he loves me and I love him, and I'm going to be different because God wants me to be different. And from that day forward, I have never looked back. Amen. And I am so thankful. But it shows you that the, it's a faith that works by love is the only faith that is going to make a lasting difference in our lives, in our families, in our walk with God. Turn with me to Matthew 16. Jesus shows us how we are to be Christians. What's what it costs, what it takes to be a follower of Jesus. Matthew 16, we're going to read verse 24. Every one of us is seeking to be a disciple of Christ. And Christ said to his disciples, and he's speaking to us today, in Matthew 16, 24. Amen when you're there? Amen. All right. Then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man, that includes you, will come after me, let him do what? Deny himself. Deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Christ is asking us to take up our cross, to deny ourselves, to surrender. So it's not just enough to accept the cross that Christ had died on, Jesus is asking us, if we're following after him, we're going to accept the cross for ourselves. He is inviting us to take up our cross. That means we need to deny ourselves. We need to deny our, our selfish inclinations. If we continue to read, we see in verse 25 it says, for whosoever will save his life shall lose it, and whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. For what is a, what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his soul? Or what shall a man gain, give in exchange for his soul? It's quite an interesting, uh, sounds like a paradox, that if you want to save your life, you need to lose it, but if you... If you want to keep your, if you don't want to lose your life, you, you need to give it. It's, it's, it's really strange, but he's showing that self, selfishness lies at the foundation of all sin. When you look at all of the Ten Commandments, we understand that sin is a transgression of the law, for Sean 3, 4. 
But and you cannot break a single commandment without selfishness and self-seeking, self-interest being the motive at the very core. And obedience to God. God is looking for a foundation of love. Not just a, a profession of love or a feeling, but a principle. The type of love that Christ gave is exemplified at the cross of Calvary. It's a self sacrificing love. The two fundamental principles are selfishness, self-preservation, or selflessness, and self-sacrificing love. These are the two principles that actuate every single principle, every action that we could, that we could have, every action that we could make. Jesus elaborated, he shared a parable about this in John chapter 12. You can turn with me to John chapter 12. He goes into more detail. He shows that by the law of the vegetable kingdom, he shows what the results of this life that Christ is inviting us to live. John chapter 12, verse 24, the lessons we can learn from farming. It's amazing. The scripture says, in John 12, 24, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. He that loveth his life shall lose it. He that hateth his life in this world shall keep it unto life eternal. So by... By casting this grain to the ground, Christ is representing himself and how he sacrificed himself for the redemption of everybody. Except the corn fall to the ground and die, he says, it abides alone. But if it die, it brings forth much fruit. So likewise, the death of Christ, it results in the fruit for the kingdom. All of us could live life eternal for his sacrifice. And the same goes for each of us. That if we would bring forth fruit as workers for God, then we must first fall to the ground. Our life needs to be buried. Self-love, self-interest, it all must perish. But the law of self-sacrifice is the law of self-preservation. The seed that's buried in the ground, it produces its fruits. And in turn, it's planted in that fruit is, has many more seeds and it can bring more and more life. So in the human life, to give is to live. What was that? To give is to live. If we want to preserve our life, then we need to freely give it to the service of man and to the service of God. And he's showing that that in a similar sense, the, the, the seed... The, the life spent on ourself is like a grain that's eaten. Once we eat it, it's gone. It does nothing for the good of others, and it is, that, that's the end. But if we take that seed and we give it and plant it into the soil, that seed becomes a plant that bears more fruits and blesses more lives. So the farmer, the only way he's able to preserve his seed is by planting more. But when we eat the only seed that we have, we have less and less. So the law of self-serving is the law of self-destruction. And it's interesting, like Job said, the thing that I feared, it came upon me. It's amazing when I see how Satan loves to tempt us, and he likes to make us think that by trying to preserve ourselves, we're going to gain something, or we're going to protect ourselves from further loss. But in reality, we need, to, by following the principles of God, He's going to protect us from the very things we're afraid of. I'll give you an example. At one point in my Christian experience, uh, I had a very close friend who had, had, had changed his, his mind or perspective, and he started to... Um, started to accuse me of things, very fault-finding, very looking at motives, questioning, criticizing, and spreading rumors and lies around to others. And 
um, it, we find that so often in a case, our trials come, the, our strongest trials come from the people that we're closest with. But in this case, um, have you ever had someone who was very close to just kind of change on you and, and start spreading like rumors or lies about you? Has, has anyone ever experienced something like that? It, it doesn't feel very good, does it? And it makes you question uh, future relationships. It almost, like there's a temptation, at least for me, to want to not, to separate from other people. I, I, I had wounds, and the wounds hurt. And that pain, in order to try to avoid the pain, I, it's like I created this shell around me that I was trying to protect myself from others from not having to endure that pain again. And it, it, was, it was getting bad because there were some people who were trying to help me, and they were being kind, and I was seeing them every single day. And I just always kept everybody at an arm's length distance. I didn't let anybody in to my, my shell that I was forming through this experience. And, and it, it finally woke me up when there was like two people that talked to me within the same week. And one of them was like, you keep your cards too close to your chest. He's like, you got to let people in. We're here to help you. And then I thought about it, and I'm like, huh, is it true what you're saying? And it made me really search. And I began to realize that what I was developing, what I was starting to develop and experience was like this similar anguish in, in the mind. It was like a mental pain that I haven't felt since before I had given my heart to Christ and, and given up my, my feelings of bitterness and forgiveness for different things. And when I was in high school, I was very depressed. I was tormented with sad thoughts. And then here I am, years into my Christian experience, and now I'm starting to feel this similar discomfort and this mental challenge. And I'm like, whoa. And I, and I began to realize that by trying to protect myself from feeling the pain from a, a relationship that gone south, I'm actually perpetuating pain. I'm creating more of it. By trying to, to preserve myself, I'm actually destroying myself. And I realized what I needed to do was to, take, to, to learn to trust again. Not because man is trustworthy, but because God is trustworthy. And that He can pull us through whatever experience we might be facing. And that there is nothing too great for God. And I began to realize that it's not if, but when someone changes their mind or they, they turn, then my trust is not in them, but it's in the Lord. And it, it changed everything. And from that day forward has marked the beginning of each day getting better than the last. It's been like the best several years of my life. And I am so thankful to have something to do for the Lord. And God is surrounded with me me with such loving people that has been an, an incredible experience. But I just wanted to share because the the motive of selfishness actually creates the very thing you're trying to avoid. But the motive of selflessness allows God to work in your life in abundance in ways that you otherwise couldn't if self is ruling in, his, in the seat, the throne of our hearts, where God wants to rule. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 4. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, we're going to read we're going to read verse 5. At the time of our trial, it, it's very hard for us to, to recognize God's blessings in the trials, to see mercy in the miseries, to see warmth from the coldness of others, but He promises all things work together for good for those who love God. In 1 Corinthians 4, 5, the scripture says, Therefore, judge nothing before the time until the Lord come, who both will bring to light the hidden things of darkness, and will make manifest the counsels of the hearts. Then every man shall have praise of God. So we can't, we can't read the hearts of others 
ourselves, we're faulty. So we're not qualified to sit on the judgment seat of others. It's very difficult for us finite man who, who only sees the outward appearance to be able to judge why people do certain things. So we are encouraged to judge nothing before the time and allow, give that word to the Lord and to move on, to move forward. And I, let, let's go over to 1 Corinthians 13. I like 1 Corinthians 13. I'm realizing that this is the motive chapter. A lot of times we look at it as the love chapter because it talks about charity. But when in context of this study, we're looking at motives. And we're seeing why we do what we do. And God is just dealing throughout the entire chapter, what is your motive? And you can really see the distinction. This, when you behold the law of God in 1 Corinthians 13, and at the end of the day, you're, you're just thinking, why did I do that? And you're reviewing your past day and the actions you made. And you can ask, you can look to these things and see what is what prompted this. 1 Corinthians 13, let's begin in verse 4. The scripture says, Charity suffereth long and is kind. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up, doth not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil. Charity thinketh no evil. So we've, in that case, Christ-like love, it places the most favorable construction on the motives and acts of others. It doesn't needlessly expose other people's faults. It doesn't listen eagerly to unfavorable reports, but rather seeks to bring out, bring to the mind the good qualities of others. Charity thinketh no evil. Charity seeketh not her own. And I encourage you that when, when we are amongst ourselves and we find that a brother or sister is speaking ill of the person, otherwise we need to guard people's reputations. We need to guard their life, their, 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 how they're spoken of. And we can ask, like, hey, did you go to that person? Did you talk to them? Because a lot of times we think it's totally fine to talk, talk about the motives of others and why they do what they do. But uh, we have to remind ourselves, we don't know the heart. God knows the heart. And this is for Him to judge. And, first, and drop down to verse 7. Notice what uh, charity does. Charity beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. So there is the reason why I had to learn to trust again. I had to, I have to believe all things because recognizing that our safety is in the Lord. And, and God is, is seeking to help us to be cheerful. We can't be cheerful when we're constantly thinking everybody's out to get us. And we're constantly thinking that people have our harm in mind or that uh, we're being chased or followed or that someone's looking at us wrong and we're constantly asking, um, can I trust this person? And, it, and we're looking for reasons why not to. But I, I would encourage that when I find, what I have changed, I've learned to trust people and just by default and then take away that trust as they show themselves untrustworthy. And living that way has been so much more f fulfilling, so much more rewarding, and I realize I've got a lot more friends that way. And we're able to work together as a team, as a body in Christ, so much more. Because I've heard it once said that a team is not a group of people who work together. A team is a group of people who trust each other. Without trust in a church, without trust in a ministry, in a business, in an organization, you cannot communicate. You can't work together and collaborate. But we are a body of Christ. Imagine it if the liver didn't want to communicate to the circulatory system. Because they, because the liver's like, I, I don't know if I can trust them. And they're unable to perform their duty. We all depend on each other. 
and and not trusting each other separates that that cohesive working together. The body of Christ, it's like an autoimmune disease when the body starts to fight itself. So let's go over to let's go over to Colossians chapter three. Colossians three and let's read verse twenty-one. I want to move on and look about some of the motives for working for God. A lot of times, uh, I praise God that we we um, have a church that is a working church. That people have active in giving Bible readings during the week. That um, people are reaching out to those around them. Mm-hmm. And so, it's very important that we take time to take inventory and see why are we working for God. And as we do anything, let us bear in mind the admonition in Colossians 3.23. And whatsoever ye do, do it how? Heartily. Heartily as unto who? The Lord and not unto men. Mm-hmm. Knowing that of the Lord ye shall receive reward of the inheritance, for ye serve the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not the amount of labor that's performed or its visible results, but it's the spirit in which the work is done that makes it of value to God. Mm -hmm. This is what God is looking for. No matter what, we can remember, we're working for God in everything that we do. Therefore, let's do it wholeheartedly with with our very best words, our best thoughts, our best minds, our best strength. We work for God and not for man. We can, let, let's actually go back to First uh, Corinthians chapter 13. Let's looking back at the motive chapter, I want to see another thing that is, it was really eye-opening in verse, verse 1. Colossians 13, I'm sorry, First Corinthians 13, verse 1. Scripture says, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, I am become a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I can remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not charity, it profited me nothing. So remember when Jesus said in Matthew 7, 21, that not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father, many will say unto me, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? Haven't we done many wonderful works? Haven't we, we done cast out devils in thy name? And Christ says, depart from me. I never knew you, ye that were iniquity. Christ says in the last days that there will be elders, evangelists, co-porters, and physicians, ministers, who have who are going to come to Christ and they're going to say, have we not spoken of you before thousands? Haven't we let out song services? Haven't we not done so many things for you? But God is looking not at the actions of which we're doing or the multitudes of our service for Him. He's looking at the motive. He's looking at the heart that we bring to the work. Are we doing it because of an obligation? Are we doing it because we have to? Are we doing it so we can be seen of men? Why do we do what we do? Because it's not the actions, friends. It's the motives that God is looking for. He's weighing both the actions and the motives. And the multitude of activities, they don't bring us closer to God. But it is a heart searching. It is aligning our will with the will of God. This is what he's looking for. This is an acceptable service. I find it interesting. It said, though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor and have not charity, but the world likes to describe charity as what? 
giving your goods to feed the poor. That's the definition of charity for, for many people. But God is saying, no, you can be very generous with your means. You can donate, you can contribute, you can help many people, but still not have charity. What did he mean by this, this charity? That if it's not included in, in, or defined by giving our goods to feed the poor. Turn with me to Matthew, or I'm sorry, Mark. The book of Mark, chapter 12. Mark chapter 12, verse 41. Mark 12, 41. Jesus here, he, he's looking at the treasury, and he sees how so many people, they're casting their money into the treasury because they're rich. They have a lot, so they're giving a lot. But we find in verse 42, And there came a certain poor widow, and she threw in two mites, which make a farthing. And he called unto his disciples and said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that this poor widow has cast more in than all they that have cast into the treasury. Why? For all they did cast in out of their what? Abundance. Their abundance. But she, out of her want, her lack, her depravity, did cast in all that she had, even all her living. The difference between the rich man that donated and the poor widow, is that the wealthy were giving, but it didn't require a sacrifice. They loved to donate and give alms before men so that they could receive the reward and have their name written on the list and be like, I contributed to this and that, and have their name on the poster like, I built this, I helped raise the funds for this church or whatever. But this woman, she gave, and her gift required a sacrifice. It was prompted from a self-sacrificing love. And to many, they can look at this poor widow and say, no, it's like, you're poor, you need this. It's only two mites. Keep it to yourself. But that widow had a heart of service. Even if it was two mites that make up a farthing, God takes note of every single farthing that is given to the Lord's cause. And he is looking at the motive, whether the motive is reluctance or willingness. He's weighing these things. And they're chronicled in his books. They're considered in the judgment. And so, even though I give my body to be burned and have not shared it, it profited me nothing. Can you imagine a martyr's death could profit nothing. People are giving their physical bodies to the stake, dying for, in their profession of Christ. But God says it profited nothing. They could be regarded as deluded enthusiasts or an ambitious hypocrite if their motive is prompted by anything other than love. Self-sacrificing love. Often we think, well, yeah, if we just sacrifice our life, then, I mean, those people are, they're, they're all good to go. They're, they're ready. But imagine getting up to the very end and just realizing it was, ev my whole life work was done because of self. It was self-seeking, self-exalting motives is why I was working for God in the way that I was. We need to search our hearts. Because you don't want to get to this state and realize that your motive was wrong all along. It is on this side of eternity that we need to search our hearts and be asking God to, to, to search us. That's why we read, the, I like that scripture song, Search me, O God, and know my heart, and try me and know my thoughts, 
and see if there be any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. Often when I do Bible studies with people, I get to this verse, and, and, I'm, and it's not surprising that I often hear, you know what I often hear when, when we read this? I don't think I'm ready to pray that prayer yet. Are you ready to pray that prayer? Deal honestly with your own souls today, friends. Today is the day to search our hearts and invite God to reveal to us the hypocrisy, the, the motives of our hearts. Sure, we may not have any outward transgression or outward um, wrongdoings, but we have, we have a heaven to gain and a hell to shun. God is seeking when the character of Christ is perfectly reproduced in his people, then he will come and claim us as his own. So this is the work that we need to be doing in this, in this day of atonement, is searching the hearts and asking God to reveal to us, to deal truly with our soul. But so often where many are, they are okay with, it, they're satisfied with an intellectual religion, or this form of godliness, but while wow, the heart is not cleansed. And we love hearing about doctrines, we love hearing about prophecies, we love hearing, studying the word of God, and we see it and we're like, this is so exciting, this is beautiful, the world needs to know this. But do we take time in our devotions, in our secret time, in the closet, to spend with God and invite Him to search us? Turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 13. 2 Corinthians 13. It has been said that men of prayer are men of power. And the Apostle Paul was definitely a man of power, was he not? Mm -hmm. there, was, there was a secret, there was part of the secret to his success was his prayer life and a certain way that he prayed. There was something specific that he did not neglect. And many laborers for God are neglecting this portion of prayer. We're going to 2 Corinthians 13.5. We've talked about in our prayers being thankful for God. We definitely have our lists that we ask and ye shall receive. There are many forms of prayer. We like to pray to God for wisdom or understanding. This is something we should also include in our daily prayers. 2 Corinthians 13, 5, the Bible says, Examine yourselves, whether ye be in the faith. Prove your own selves, know ye not your own selves, how that Jesus Christ is in you, except ye be reprobates. Every follower of Christ should daily examine himself, that he may be perfectly acquainted with his own conduct. When we review our life, when we review our day, and we pass through the different scenes that have gone, that have taken place, and we ask ourselves, why did I do that? If you get a knowledge of yourself that is so valuable, because it's kind of like a road map that you can realize where you're going and what you need to do. Otherwise, we're, we're like at, we're at, at sea, without a chart, without a compass, we don't know what's going on, so we are encouraged to examine ourselves, to invite God to search us, because as, as the verse says, see if there be any wicked way in us, lead me in the way everlasting. To neglect the, the searching of our heart is to neglect the way of everlasting life. It is deliberately choosing death instead of life. When God is laying before us life and death, blessings and cursing, He's saying, choose life that thou next see may live. He's looking at our motives. And we can see when our conscience approves something or it condemns something. But so often, the Holy Spirit is speaking to us. And He brings to remembrance where we have gone wrong, but it's just a fleeting thought. And we shrug it off and we, we don't think about it again. We're not listening to the promptings of the Holy Spirit. 
But the time to change is now. Today is the day. Jesus was speaking with his disciples in Matthew 26. If you can turn with me to Matthew 26, verse 40. I was, we, we've been studying in the Desire of Ages for family worship, and we just finished the Garden of Gethsemane. This is very relevant in, in, in our hearts and our minds, and we, the story of, of these closing chapters. Matthew 26 and verse 40. Notice what Jesus, Jesus is, is here asking his, he's commanding his disciples to do. But they were neglectful too. In verse 40, the scripture says, And when he cometh unto the disciples, and findeth them asleep, and saith unto Peter, What? Could, you, could ye not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray. Why? That ye enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Christ is inviting us to watch and to pray. And the reason is so that we enter not into temptation. Sometimes I, I, I would often read this and I would wonder, what does that mean to watch? When it says watch and pray, what is going on with that word watch? And as I'm studying this, I'm realizing so much that with, with our eyes, it is, we are like, search me, O oh God and examine yourselves. And this watchfulness, is part of it is, is, is watching and reviewing our life and, reckon, and examining ourselves and searching the motives, searching the heart, gaining a, a knowledge of ourselves as one of the greatest blessings we can and, and to become acquainted with our weak points. That way, we, when we are assailed by temptation, we can fortify our weak points. That eventually, our, we, through watchfulness and prayer, our weakest points can be so guarded as to become our strongest points. Have any of you have ever found that sometimes there's something that you were tempted with, and God revealed to you that temptation, and through studying the Word of God or seeking, praying for victory and, and watching and praying and studying, you begin to realize the promises and your gathering, the, these precious the words of God, and then God grants you the victory. Amen. And that victory is clear and decided. It's done. And it becomes one of your most favorite subjects to talk about. Amen. It's often the, the way the Lord has led you in the past is how you want to lead others today. Those are some of the most passionate and enjoyable experiences. Brother Michael just preached a sermon. He was talking about identifying your defining moments. What were the moments that defined who you are? And part of this is helping you to recognize through watchfulness, through searching, through examination, through reviewing your past and to realize where can I study the word of God on the subject where have God strengthened me and let me let me impart this to others that's why God promised my grace is sufficient for thee my strength is made perfect in weakness in our weakness God is stronger than our, ourselves and we can trust in him so this watchfulness, I was looking at that, and I came across another verse. If we can go to Revelation chapter 3. Revelation 3 reveals to us what we should do as, after we examine ourselves. As a result of becoming acquainted with our standing before God, our motives, our past, and, and we begin to realize what is going on. Revelation 3 shows us uh, the next step. It says, And unto the angel of the church of Sardis write, These things saith he, that hath the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know thy works, that thou hast the name, that thou livest, and are dead. Be what? Be watchful. Be what? Watchful. Watchful 
and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. For I have not found my works perfect before God. Remember, therefore, how thou hast received and heard, and hold fast, and do what? Repent. Repent. That's a turning away from sin. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come on thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come to thee. So through watchfulness, we can see our weakness of character. And it's not enough to be constantly confessing again and again, sinning and repenting, sinning and repenting. What we need to do to overcome is to study the opposite traits of character. Because the law of beholding states in 2 Corinthians 3.18, by beholding we become what? Change. Be changed. So it's not enough to behold ourselves and our shortcomings, our failures, and our mistakes. If you do this only, you're going to be very discouraged. You're going to be hopeless. So we need to set our eyes to behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. And by beholding Christ and His loveliness, not just, well, yes, in general could help, but even specifically the, the weak point that we have, study the strength that Christ has. If you are struggling with patience, go look at Jesus and how he endured hardship, how he endured when people tempted him to aggravation or when they tempted him to be impatient. If you struggle with being of good cheer, go look at Christ when he was on the boats while the disciples were freaking out saying, Master, carest thou not that we perish? And he spoke to the storm and he said, Peace, be still. O ye of little faith, when you're perplexed about the future, go study the life of Christ and the teachings of Christ and how he said, consider the lilies, how they toil not, neither do they spin, but God clothes all of them. And that God cares about you. Sufficient to the day is the evil thereof. Being intentional with our devotions and studying what is relevant in our life, that we can actually develop these opposite traits of character as a result of having a knowledge of ourselves. We see our need. And sometimes when we're opening God's Word and we don't know where to start, we don't know where to begin or where to continue, we don't know what to study next, it would be well to pray to God and just to ask Him, search my heart and see what do you say that I need. And He'll show you things that you didn't even know you had problems. He'll even show you things that you thought were great and He realizes it was all self from the beginning. And he's trying to purge out the selfishness and to re and implant the heaven-born, self-sacrificing love. And it's only by beholding that we are going to be changed. I'd like to end with, with 1 John chapter 3. If we could turn in our Bibles to 1 John chapter 3. Verse 16. We're dealing with the motivation for reform. The only thing that is going to strengthen us and give us the power to overcome. First John chapter 3 and verse 16, the scripture says, Hereby perceive we the love of God, because he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. Amen. Drop down to verse 19. And hereby we know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before him. For if our heart condemn us, God is greater than our hearts and knoweth all things. Beloved, if our heart condemn us not, then we have confidence towards God. As we are reviewing our, our, our lives, we can realize that if we are under the condemnation of God and we're weighed with a guilty conscience, we can go to Christ. Because God is greater than, our, than our, our hearts. He is greater than the condemnation. He took that upon us on Calvary, upon himself for us on Calvary. 
and we can trust in His strength and His power. I want to share and end with this um, this quote from Steps of Christ, page 21. Beautiful little book. It says, Oh, let us contemplate the amazing sacrifice that has been made for us. Let us try to appreciate the labor and energy that heaven is expending to reclaim the lost and bring them back to the Father's house. Motives stronger and agencies more powerful could never be brought into operation. The exceeding reward for right doing, the enjoyment of heaven, the society of angels, the communion and love of God and His Son, the elevation and extension of all our powers throughout eternal ages, friends. Are these not mighty incentives and encouragements to urge us to give the heart's loving service to our Creator and Redeemer? Amen. There's no greater motive. So this is what we can behold, we can communicate and share with others. If it's your desire to lay your heart open to God and invite Him to try your heart, to search you and see if there be any wicked way in you, and to leave all at the foot of the cross and let God transform you, then I invite you to kneel with me for a word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we thank you so much for sending us your son to die for us. We are so grateful that you have given us the word, your word, that we need not guess at anything, that you have a remedy for the sin sick soul, and how often we deceive ourselves in, in trusting to our hearts when the heart of man is deceitful above all things. Who can know it? We don't even know our own hearts, Lord, but you search the hearts, and we invite you to search